Hi, everyone. So it's uh, Crossing Boundaries. Three practitioners reflect on their education and career journeys. And we have with us today, we have all the way from Chicago, we've got Dawn Gavin. Uh, she's the Director of Contemporary Practice uh, at the School of Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, in her own work, she investigates issues of loss, appropriation, identity, and displacement, employing a range of media from collage and installed drawings to digital video. Recent shows include one at Baltimore Museum of Art, Maryland Institute College of Art, and the Philadelphia Art Alliance. We have, uh, to my right, Mia Taylor, uh, leader for the BA Fine Art uh, course at Central St. Martins. Her work considers how different disciplines describe and represent the natural environment. Um, and it's worth noting that, that Mia's practice is, is, is interdisciplinary, using paint, performance, video, but also that she works across disciplines and has recently uh, had some collaborations with the Oceanography Department and Astrono uh, Astronautics. Astronautics? Astro Astronautics. Um, recent shows include one at the Jerwood Visual Arts, uh, Whitechapel Gallery, and APT. Um, Mary Evans, to my left, course leader for BA Fine Art at Chelsea College of, of Art. Evans makes site-specific uh, installations using a variety of media, paper, rubber, paint, print, digital media, uh, on a variety of surfaces, paper, walls, flooring, glass. Her practice is fluid and mutable in terms of her approach and the materials used. Evans' research interests are centered on social, political, and historical frameworks of diaspora, migration, global mobility, and exchange. And recent shows include one that's it's currently on at the John Hansard, isn't it? One at the John Hansard Gallery in Southampton, uh, the Biennale in Brazil at Porto Alegre, and the Anolfini in Bristol. Um, so we've got... Uh, an interesting challenge today, and that is that three of us are here, but, but Dawn is all the way over there in Chicago joining us via the joys of webcam. Um, so forgive me if I'm sometimes picking up the phone because we're, we're, we're linking up in a number of different ways there. The first question I wanted to ask our panelists, and I'll go one by one, and perhaps Dawn will start with you, was um, for you to describe the journey that, that, uh, that you've been on from when you first decide you're interested in the arts, to getting to art college and, and uh, doing something, and then, and then beyond there, how you've got to your place now uh, as, as the leader of uh, uh, contemporary practices in, in Chicago. So Mia, describe that for, for me. At what age did you decide you wanted to explore the arts, and then what's the journey been to get to the dizzying heights of today? Um, the dizzying heights, thanks Alex. Um, I think, well, I think like many journeys, it's kind of incremental. When I was at school, I really enjoyed making art and, um, and I decided to do a foundation. And then on the foundation, I learnt about fine art and learnt that fine art was um, the discipline I was most interested in, um, which was quite surprising to me and felt like a really challenging discipline. Um, and so then I applied to do um, the degree in fine art. But actually, I think the whole thing is one step at a time. And one step, at each step, the subject reveals itself, the possibility for the subject reveals itself, and the possibility for it to be a part of your life, or for my life anyway, revealed itself. Where did you study fine art? Um, so I studied, I did my BA at Nottingham, and then I did my MA um, at Chelsea College of Art. And I did my MA five years after my BA, and I think it was really useful for me to take time out. It certainly wasn't an obvious step to go and continue necessarily being a, well, continue having a practice. Um, and it was only in that time of five years out that I had a number of different jobs. Um, through which I realized that I wanted to kind of commit to having a practice and giving it a go. I mean, one of the jobs I had when I was, I mean, I had lots of jobs. I had jobs in, um, I had a job as a receptionist in an American investment bank. I had a job in an advertising agency. I had loads of different jobs. And um, one of the jobs was um, finally through volunteer work, got myself working in um, an arts production agency. And through that, I realized that actually there were many different art worlds. And I think before then I'd felt that the art world was too competitive or just not right, not, the place, not a place that I could make anything work in. And through working in that job, I realized that there were many different art worlds, many different ways of um, having a platform uh, and kind of getting by in this kind of, I don't want to say career path, but you know, choosing this as a... Um, of doing things. So, yeah, 
that was kind of quite important for me. So, so I've heard some rustling from the monitor, which suggests that perhaps we have Dawn now uh, coming in, beaming in from Chicago. So Dawn, could you describe then that journey from first deciding that the, the art or art was something you were interested in to, to where you are today? Sure. Can you, can you hear me? Oh, can we have one second, Dawn? Can you, can you hear me all right then? Dawn, I'm really sorry, we're slightly struggling again. We had you for a second, but it seems that you vanished. I'm, I'm going to come over to, to Mary. If worse comes to the worst, Dawn will speak to me on the phone and I will translate for you all. Um, Mary, how about you? Was that me? No. Um, I, I kind of, at a very young age, decided I wanted to be an artist. And I had no idea what that meant. I didn't know. All I knew was that I liked to sit at the kitchen table and make things and get in my mum's way. Um, so I, I, I was a bit of a juggernaut. I just went from school to A-levels to foundation to GA. And then I applied for an MA straight after BA and didn't get in. I was absolutely gutted. <laughs> didn't get into the Royal College. And then the following year, I applied and I got into Goldsmiths and then decided that I was never meant to go to the Royal College. So, you know, that was all fine. So, but I agree with what Mary just said. It's kind of step by step by step, really. Um, just, yeah, just trying to carve out a, a, a place and not always knowing what it means and, and kind of putting up with disappointment, but maybe something better or more suitable comes along, although you might not realise it at the time. Did you, but either of you, have a, have a real sense of uh, trajectory, of, of what it was you were aiming at, or, or did that sort of just evolve and, and sort of emerge as you were on that journey? Because I guess there's, there's, a, there's an ease with which, looking back, we can construct a very sort of direct narrative for it, but actually, maybe it's not like that when you're experiencing it. Maybe, uh, uh, and Dawn, I'm still holding on, so don't worry, we'll be back to you in a second. Mia. Um, no, never had an idea of a trajectory. I mean, you can see what other people around you are doing, what your tutors are doing, and what the people you, uh, you know, what the people you're looking up to are doing. Um, but I think to have thought that for myself didn't really necessarily seem possible until these things became possible. Um, but I think what seemed really clear was that you had to stick at this thing for those things to open up. And so actually, and I think as Mary just said, you know, not knowing what you're doing all the time, or that's not what Mary said, but not knowing necessarily what this is that you're working towards, and also literally in the studio, but just trusting that through doing the work that something will open up. Um, and I think lots of things, and I think also, you know, I've said yes to a lot of things that I really probably didn't really want to do it when, when they came to me or that I didn't trust I could do but actually through that process of saying yes, they've turned out to be great things and, you know, things open up. Yeah, I mean, that makes me think, I'm really interested that, that things that look like an opportunity when they come your way aren't always the opportunity you think they are and things that don't look like an opportunity at all but you kind of say yes for odd reasons end up becoming the thing that actually is a really interesting opportunity. Mary, how about you? Uh, clear trajectory or not? No, not really. Well, it, it, oh, God, I'm, I'm Mary, Mary, quite contrary here. In, um, when I filled in my application form to go to BA, I knew that I wanted to go to Gloucestershire College of Arts and Technology. I, did, I grew up in London. I didn't want to go to College of London. So I filled in the application form, and I didn't fill in the discipline until the day I had to post it, because I could have done printmaking or textiles or painting, and I just knew that I wanted to go there. And then I, my logic was just, oh, I'll do painting. I can do textiles any old time at home or whatever. I'll put painting down, because if I do that, then they'll allow me to do printmaking. But if I put printmaking down, then they won't allow me to do painting. And that was just a, a little strategic thought that I had, and it worked out. But then, um, so I, I, I was, my degree show was half printmaking, half painting. So it was, you know, uncertainty uh, along the way, but, and, and always, not, not necessarily hedging your bets, but keeping things open, I think was really important. Okay, well, I, oh, of course, yeah. 
Sorry, I just thought that was really important, Mary, because actually when you applied to do um, your BA, you applied to a discipline. And actually, when I applied for my BA, it, there was no discipline. It was just fine art. And I hadn't realised at the time when I applied how significant that was for me. And actually, at Chelsea, on my MA, it was also just fine art. So I never studied under a discipline, um, which is uh, really, I don't know, I think these things can be quite formative. Um, but also don't matter that much because you can choose to make these decisions later. I mean, I think that's really key, actually, that not just the interdisciplinarity, but, but even beyond the medium you're working and actually beyond the, 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 the centre of the discipline, that actually, if I look around at St. Martin's and, and what the students are doing, the fashion students, the architecture students, the fine arts students, they're often making things that look fairly similar. It, it might be that where they're coming from, the, the, the direction of travel is slightly different, or how they're contextualizing it might be slightly different. But there is, I think there's more scope for skipping between disciplines today than perhaps there was. Some of those boundaries have been eroded quite, quite nicely, I think. Um, just while we're getting uh, Dawn sorted, um, Another question in relation to that, and that is, at what point did you first, or do you remember when you first called yourself an artist? Somebody asked you, what did you do when you first claimed that term, and was that significant or not? <laughs> okay, yeah, so for a long time I called myself, I, um, I, was, I was an administrator, because I was, because I was working in lots of part-time jobs on receptions and stuff like that. So on my passport, I was an administrator for a really, really long time. But then when I had my first teaching job, I kind of realized I had to change that. And I think that's when I started sometimes, sometimes, calling myself an artist because I have felt like you know, there was a responsibility to own that position because I was now working with um, other people and I was in that role. So yeah, it took me a long time to want to take that word on and partly because of the questions it opened up and uh, yeah, yeah. So Guy, I'm looking over to you. Is, uh, is the sound sorted for Dawn? Yeah? Do you want me to test that? Can you hear me yet? Yeah, Dawn, we've got you! Woohoo! Wow. <laughs> so Dawn, perhaps you could tell us about your journey from deciding you're interested in the arts to getting to college to ending up in Chicago. Well, you know, so I've, I'm originally from just outside Glasgow, and when I first applied to art school, I, I didn't get in my first year. I applied when I was in sixth year in um, high school, secondary school, and didn't get in, which was devastating. So I, I worked freelance for years as an illustrator and applied again the next year. I barely got in. I went to Duncan Georgeson College of Art in Dundee in Scotland, and I got in by the skin of my teeth. I was on the wait list and managed to get in and, and no more. So when I when I showed up, I was a first-generation student. I didn't have a framework in my family to understand what going to college meant. And I thought that because I'd been working freelance and I'd done some internships in advertising agencies in Glasgow as a teenager, I thought that I would go into graphic design or illustration. I fell in love with painting. I didn't even know that I could paint, and I fell in love with it. And it was a really difficult choice for me to decide which department I would go into a design track or, or fine art. It felt like a real split at that time. It was the late 80s. And I didn't feel like I fit in with the, the painters. And sometimes the painters <laughs> didn't feel like I fit in with them. But I, I was fortunate that I had parents who just wanted me to do whatever I was enthusiastic about at the time and didn't bring any judgment to it. I think we all didn't know any better. So I was encouraged to do what I wanted and do what, to do what I enjoyed. And I, I studied drawing and painting. I had no idea what I was going to do with that. I was very self-conscious about what I would do when I graduated. And I assumed that I would just return what I'd been to what I'd been doing previously. I then went on and did my master's at Dundee. I did that in fine art. And again, I assumed that when I finished that program, I would perhaps return to what I'd been doing previously when I, um, when I was working as a freelance illustrator. What was interesting was that while I was going through graduate school, I was doing regular jobs, tending bar, working in restaurants. And when I look at my position now as an administrator in an arts institution, I think some of my sort of skills that I employ daily as, as an administrator, I actually learned when I was tending bar and waitressing, which I thought were kind of adjacent to what my interest was. 
what was interesting is that it took me a while to be able to call myself an artist. It was even harder for me to call myself a painter for a long time. Artist was more generic. Painter was too specific. And my department hired me as faculty almost immediately outside of grad school. So I, I got into teaching, which is nothing that I intended to do. And oddly, teaching for me was a, a more pure form of my ideas and exploring ideas as an artist than I thought sometimes making my studio practice was at that time. There was kind of, was which had become idea driven by that point. So I, I feel like I took a really sort of convoluted journey and that I wasn't maybe going directly from point A to point B with any intention. I, I still don't think that I have a lot of intention and where I've ended up, I think I've been very lucky, but I also think that you make some of your own luck. And then I think I've been fortunate that I've been surrounded by mentors and frankly, some people who I studied with, people who I made friends with when I was in my first week of undergraduate in my first year, have remained friends and are part of my journey and have kind of compelled me to, you know, take some of the choices that I have and pursue some of the interests that I have in my practice. So that's the kind of, that's the short version. How I got to America is another version of that, but that's part two. I've, yeah, I've, I've, um, I've been told perhaps that there's a, a, something to do with a bet in America, but perhaps we'll move on to that a bit later on. Um, so. I think it's interesting that we're already talking about this as a circuitous journey to wherever we've got to. Um, and, and, and I was talking earlier to Mia prior to, to being on stage here, and one of the things that we sort of perhaps noted was that it was a combination of single-mindedness and flexibility, that on the one hand, uh, a sort of wanting to continue doing this making stuff that we were doing, but, on, but, but then being flexible enough to see opportunities when they come along to, to allow for that sort of movement to, to go in there. And I do feel, in my more optimistic moments, that fine art prepares you quite well for that circuitous journey, that, that, that those transferable skills that Dawn was talking about actually is something that's embedded in the discipline, because there isn't a, a direct route ever in fine art, and so perhaps it's one of the things that, that students get good at uh, negotiating. Do you think that's the case? Or Yes, I, I, I agree. I think that fine art prepares you to be resilient and to, to, be, to draw on skills that you may not even know that you, that you have. Um, you know, as young people start, like, you know, two weeks ago our students started and so they started this circuitous journey and um, we started them off doing lots of peer work and lots of collaboration so that they can really help each other and I'm still friends with the friends that I made on BA you know 35 years ago and these young people who just started last week are hopefully going to be make really strong friendships and bonds and will still be friends in 30 years time and really kind of look out for each other and support each other it's really important but yeah we I think uh, a degree in art fine art art uh, it's, what's it called now? Creative Industries. Um, <laughs> kind of, uh, yeah, enables you to be quite strong. Yeah, I, I, I really do think that's true. And I think that there's something about art uh, or a BA, because the students are determining what they're doing right from the word go, um, there's a sense in which uh, the students have, uh, have kind of control over their education. And that sort of taking charge of it means that they're in quite a good position to take charge of their career once they get beyond it, I think. Mia, do, would you like to add anything there? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I completely agree. And I've always thought, actually, that um, you know, fine art education really encourages resourcefulness. The self, the self-directed nature of fine art means that you're constantly having to set your own boundaries, which means that you're making choices about materials, you're making choices about ideas, you're making choices about process, um, and many other things. And you're having to kind of find your roadmap every time by yourself. And so if you kind of hit brick walls, you're the person that, that then has to find a way around it. Um, and I think that resourcefulness can extend to so many other ways of working. Of course, we can apply that in the studio, but I think also in life, as Mary said earlier, you know, lots of rejections, you know, when you're trying to start being an artist, you're going to be applying to lots of things, and you're going to be rejected probably from at least 80, 90% of them. Um, and I think even navigating those application forms is a, a form of um, 
you know, you're learning. You're learning all the time through a process of doing. And, and I think that is, that, that brings about those skills of flexibility and resourcefulness, which, yeah. That's really interesting in terms of rejection, because a number of us have mentioned that already. And I do think that if rejection is something that cuts right to the heart of you and you can't move forward beyond it, then, then that becomes a problem because every time you encounter a struggle, it becomes very difficult. If, if it's something that is just part of the system and you understand that I have to get through eight rejections to get to my, you know, the one that isn't, then actually it, it becomes something that isn't a problem anymore. And perhaps that's why artists are good at coping with uh, situations in which there might be economic unrest, there might be, you know, a, a more sort of difficult job market, because actually they're quite used to that sense of, of rejection, and it's, it, it's understood for what it is. It isn't something that's a, a sort of profound rejection, but simply at that point that didn't work out. Dawn, how about you? What do you think about this idea that um, our students are, in a sense, preparing themselves for the world outside in a different way in, in, in the creative arts? I, I couldn't agree more. I think that it's interesting as you're, you're all talking about rejection, I'm really struck that it's maybe the wrong word. It's that we, it's the default word that we use, but it's that you encounter something that you have to adjust to, that you have to shift your weight for. When we pursue a studio practice, we are engaged in research, preparation, getting groundwork done, but then in the mechanics of actually moving into the studio and making things, things don't go according to plan, things respond differently than you intend or expect. That can be the subject that you're pursuing or because it can be conceptual or it can be material. And we adjust and we maneuver around these things. And I think that that's a really compelling way to think about our ability to flex and adapt and be purposeful and have intention behind our work, but also have the capacity to be um, fluid in our responses, that we're not rigid and sort of inherently sort of locked in, that we kind of go with the flow and find solutions through that. I think it's inherently part of our process and we don't always um, put language to it to make that as apparent but you know I, it's only now when I reflect back on my career that I see that I've been training for these opportunities all along so I think that we have incredible sort of uh, breadth of skills that we apply to lots of different circumstances because of our training. Yeah, and certainly if I'm thinking about the studios we were talking about just then, if, I, if something is a disaster, if I make something that is not successful by whatever you know, metrics I'm measuring it, that's usually incredibly useful in the studio because then the next four or five pieces are thinking about how to solve that issue that arose in the last piece. If I make something that I think is really successful, that might be quite a block, that might be a bit of a sort of dead end because then I, I don't know what to do next. So I'm going to think then a little bit about sort of coming to art school. And one of the things um, I know that Dawn, you mentioned you were the first person in, in your family to go to, to university. Certainly, I was the uh, first person in my family to go to art school, not university, but to, to think about art as a, as a career path. Um, and I wanted to ask, who did we need to seek permission from, or who did we need to seek approval from to get to art school? Was there, was there a sense that we had to convince parents, uh, partners, <laughs> siblings, whatever that might be? Who, who were those people that might not understand what art school was, and how did we do that? How did we get to it? Or maybe it wasn't difficult, maybe it was an easy uh, approach. I'll start with you, Mary, this time. This is a really interesting one for me because, um, as I said earlier, I'd always wanted to be an artist, didn't know what it meant, but just like pottering around making arty, crafty things. And then through school, you know, did kind of A-level art and other subjects. And uh, I was a little bit concerned because I'd gone to, I'd been sent off to boarding school to do my A-levels. And something just got into my head that my parents would be upset with me if I turned around and said, I want to go to art college after they paid all this money to send me to boarding school. But, so I, I was kind of ready for an argument. I metaphorically rolled up my sleeves and said, you know, mum, dad, I'm going to apply to foundation expecting. And they were like, yeah, and? Yeah. Well, we always knew that you'd go to art college. I was like, oh, God. So the wind was absolutely knocked out of my sails. Like, There's no argument. And I just went. And then this is what I mean about being a bit of a juggernaut. Before, I went to foundation. Then I did BA. And then I did MA. So I didn't have to convince anyone, but maybe just myself. Because when I was on foundation, I was absolutely convinced that I was going to apply to do graphic design BA. 
until we got our first graphic design assignment and I thought, what on earth were you thinking? I, I couldn't bear that discipline. But now my practice as an artist is very kind of graphic ish based and kind of hard edged and uh, s about semiotics and signs and symbols and that kind of thing. Yeah, that's really interesting. There is definitely a crossover. And I do think that disciplines become really interesting at their margins, that when one discipline starts to fall into another, it becomes really interesting. Um, uh, Dawn, how about you? Who did you need to convince anyone at all to get to art school? You know, it's interesting. I was very fortunate in that my parents um, kind of just went with it and, and I didn't need persuading. It certainly helped that they thought I was going to go into graphic design from the outset. What's interesting was it was something I'd wanted to do from the minute I could hold a pencil. I, I didn't at any point ever want to do anything other than go to art school before I even really understood what art school was. However, I have to say once I got to art school, once I arrived, the person I had to convince was myself. I I had a really good heavy dose of imposter syndrome and I think switching from a design interest into fine art sort of brought that on as a kind of burden to myself so I had to go through a kind of ongoing process of keeping myself in check and a, a little bit of sort of skepticism about what I was doing but in, in a, a balance that kept me motivated and wanting to be engaged but I think that it took a long time for me to believe in myself in that process so I would answer I, I was the one who had to be convinced once I got there. It's interesting that both you and Mary said the same thing in regards to convincing yourselves. I do think that if not all of us, most of us have that sense of imposter syndrome. And I think it's, it's uh, quite healthy, I think, hopefully. I think if you don't have a sense of imposter syndrome, <laughs> perhaps it, that, that might be a question. Um, Mia, how about you? Did you need to convince anyone? Um, well, I was also first generation in my family going to university. And so I think there was a bit of convincing um, going on. But actually, oddly, there was more convincing that had even though there was less purchase for my parents, but um, more convincing with my when I did the MA. And I think that was because then it seemed clear that I was taking it seriously and they were quite seriously worried about what that meant for my future. Um, but at BA level, um, yeah, a little, bit, a little bit of convincing. But I think also that imposter syndrome um, thing is really, you know, it's really pervasive in so many ways. And I think... I was really lucky when I was studying on my BA to have some tutors that really were just amazing actually in um, making it seem possible and making it not seem like it was just one particular kind of person doing this um, and that was just really, 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 really valuable. Yeah, I mean perhaps I'll add my version just because I did need to convince my parents who um, they, they'd come here from Spain, they kind of understood the UK education system, kind of, but not entirely. And they were very worried about art as a, as a career path, what would I do afterwards, how would I do it. Um, Foundation's brilliant for giving you a buffer, because it's only one year, so I could, I could just about convince them that I could do the foundation, because then afterwards I'd go and do something sensible like architecture, and then, and then it slowly just sort of fell into place. Um, and I wonder if that's changed today. I wonder if that sense that, that the career path but, um, is still there as a concern for parents or not. Certainly, one of the things that I think is really important to note is that it's not the majority of our students who leave our courses and become artists. They do a wide range of things in related subjects and unrelated subjects, and, but I still think that that education in, in fine art is incredibly valuable, as we were talking earlier about resourcefulness, about inventiveness, about creativity, in regard to all sorts of things. Um, uh, and I think that's, that's significant and, uh, and important. It's not you're doing this so that you become that and in, in that fixed way that you might think of, say, for example, a a degree in medicine where you're going to become a doctor. There's, you're doing this to, to find a way of learning, develop a way of, of being in the world that's going to help you in, in all sorts of disciplines, I think. So if we're talking about differences then, I'd like us to think a little bit about do we think that the landscape has changed in the last, well, whenever we applied, in the last X number of years? Or has it changed in the last two or three years post-COVID? And do we think that, that young people coming into um, arts education now are facing a different future? And do we know what that future is even at the moment? And perhaps I'll start with you, Dawn. You know, it's interesting when I think about um, what I perceived to 
be opportunities for myself. I think I was quite modest in my ambition. I think that students now are um, more openly ambitious and see a, a wider range of options available for them. So, for example, it never occurred to me that I could have come to the States to do my master's degree. It, it didn't occur to me to come to the States um, to, to work either as a, as a lecturer until somebody sort of pushed me to, to do that and encouraged me to do that. Um, since I've been in America, I've, I've encouraged a number of students from UK schools that I've had connections with, like colleagues in different departments, to come and do their master's here. And a number of those students are now faculty across the US. It was inconceivable to me when I was an undergraduate student that that might have been a path that I would have taken. And I think that we have a much smaller sense of the world now that international travel is much more likely and um, it's more possible, of course, not in the last 18 months, but certainly. But I think that, that there's more opportunities, there's more access to information. When I was first hired at Dundee, I actually ran a Life After Art School program, which was somewhat ironic because I hadn't had a Life After Art School. I'd gone straight from my uh, degree into teaching. But at that time, I used to have to write to organisations and mail letters letters and ask for information about residencies and printmaking sort of um, sort of uh, opportunities and compile it all and then put that information together for students. It's, it's incredible how much access we have to information now and how immediate it can be and that can really, I think, fast track students' possibilities for their careers and for what their life after graduation can be, which is remarkable. And, and I only imagine how much further they're going to go than, say, my generation did in the same sort of duration of time. Yeah, I, mean, I, th I think that's really intriguing. I, I think there's certainly a sense, if I think about our students, that, they, that you're right, that they're they're asking for more, they, they have a sense of real ambition and if they're not getting what they perceive as the right sort of information, they're, they're letting us know very quickly. Um, one thing I did want to say, however, was that I do think that there's more than one way to um, get to <laughs> meet your ambitions. And I think there's a misconception in the arts that actually what you have to do is go to lots of openings and be pushy and shovey and grab. And that, that, that's, that's a way of doing it. And there's nothing wrong with that way. But there's lots of other modes in which you might find a path into uh, where you want to go. And, 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 and if arts education is by necessity bespoke, because each student is developing their own individual practice. I think also their relationship to their career is bespoke. It's, it, different artists find different ways of doing it. Certainly for me, someone, that, a friend of mine, Joe Addison, another artist said to me years ago, and it really stayed with me as my primary mode of having things happen, is let things come to you, don't chase. And for me that works. I'm not so good at pouncing, but I'm pretty good at noticing when something comes my way. And, uh, and so it's just, yeah, making it work for, for the sort of, I guess, personality or your strengths or whatever that might be. Mary. Um, I think there, there are a few things at, at play. So, for instance, well, firstly, parents are always going to worry, I think, about what their, their children are going to, the prospects that their children might have after education. But in the last couple of years, though, so our, our new first years who started a couple of weeks ago, whether they came from foundation or A level, have, have been disadvantaged. You know, they they studied online. They haven't been. They haven't socialised in the same kind of way that young people would normally do. So we have had to adapt our first five weeks of our first year to be a little bit more handholdy, a little bit more nurturing, a little less about them deciding for themselves exactly what they're going to do from day one because they have not had to do anything like that you know so it's been really um, we've really had to pay attention to what's been going on in the world for the last 18 months and um, and the other thing is is the pipeline so when I was at art school, it was very, very undiverse. Um, you know, our pipeline is more is not still not diverse enough, but it's more than it was um, 30 odd years ago, and that has to continue to open up. And um, young people from different backgrounds have to be able to feel that they can be in this space and they can study along with everyone else. And another thing that, that um, impacts everything is that they are all paying fees. And I didn't pay any fees when I did my BA and I paid very, very minimal fees for my MA. So there is a slight 
um, change in, in tack or change in attitude that students come with? What am I getting for my nine and a half thousand pounds? You know, what are you going to teach me? What am I going to leave with? Is this going to be worth it? That kind of thing. And certainly, I mean, I'm, and I imagine we all are very critical of that sort of fees um, uh, environment. And, and the negative side of it is that students become consumers in a sense. Um, but I do think the positive side of it can be that they're demanding, and, and I think demanding is really exciting when, when, when you feel that they're asking, ask, even, even if you're having to turn around to them and say, well, actually, you might be asking for the wrong thing or in the wrong way, but, but let's work together to develop it. I do think that um, co-developing curricula is, is, is an exciting thing that seems to be much more possible now than it was, than it was in the past. Mia, any thoughts about changes? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Um, I was actually thinking about changes for students when they um, leave and, you know, when they enter the world and they think about how they build a practice um, off the back of graduation. But I think actually that, that thing of demanding and having different kinds of expectations because they're now paying for their education is also maybe a thing that, that spills into what happens when they leave. Because I was thinking, you know, the things that have changed since I graduated is that there are loads more regional opportunities to do things, loads more residencies it seems to me, um, and also lots of different kinds of venues, I think at, at all different levels. So there are lots of lots more artist run spaces, lots more opportunities to do things that are grassroots for students when they leave, especially if they've got the gumption to do it, which comes from being demanding and like being able to, to reach out and do that. Um, you know, we were also talking before about the, the post-COVID landscape in the art world, which obviously hasn't had time to settle, but also um, is really interesting in thinking about what's going to open up and before um, COVID certainly the art world seemed to be in quite a maybe I mean it's too general for me to say but there were certainly some you know I think there were some things that were quite set certainly I would say in London or and so I think it, it, it's a really interesting opportunity to open things up. But I also think regionally things are super exciting at the moment. And if you can't afford a studio in London, um, there are other places to be um, and lots of other communities to be working with. Um, I'm, I'm being signaled from the side that we're about to run out of time, but perhaps we'll draw it to a close. Just a, a few last comments from, from all of us. Um, I mean, I do think that one of the things for me that seems really notable is the shift that's happening in the art world at the moment, well, and the post-COVID, the shift that's happened in the world, and there's a sense of uncertainty, which, in, you know, in one way is, is perhaps anxiety-inducing, but on the other hand, that does provide opportunities for, for an unknown future, and a future that perhaps I won't be responsible for defining, but maybe those young people coming into education now will be the, the, the artists who redefine what the art world is, and, it, and for me, it's a question around what's the site of production and what's the site of encounter for art. It, is it only the studio and the gallery or is it now that actually we've, we've uh, diversified where people might be making and how they might be showing work and that seems to be potentially really exciting in terms of a, an unknown future. Um, and that's me being very positive and optimistic, I guess. But there's, there's the <laughs> um, any last comments from the panel? I, I'll come to you, John. Any sort of closing thoughts on uh, the future of the art and, and what our young people are getting themselves into today? Absolutely. I think that artists have infiltrated everybody else's subject. We're the, the magpies of the, of the cultural world. And I think that artists have the capacity to find some of the most imaginative and dynamic solutions to lots of different problems in different fields. And I think it's it's the artists of this world that give me sort of optimism and um, looking to the future, what they're capable of. So I think that the sort of the, the barriers are out of the way and artists have the, the capacity to engage in all sorts of different disciplines and subjects and find really viable, tenable solutions for moving forward, which I found profoundly positive. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think our art is moving centre stage in so many different arenas. Mary, any last thoughts from you? Um, I think um, I'd say be brave. Um, you, you can really surprise yourself. You know, I did things like... Um, I went to Amsterdam for four years, studied for two years, and then thought, well, maybe I'll just stay for another couple of years. And had I not done that, I, certain opportunities that came my way wouldn't have done. So kind of be brave, and, and, and you will be strong and resilient as a result of being an artist anyway, which will help you take on lots, lots of other things. 
gesagt, I couldn't agree more. Mia. Um, yeah, I suppose I was just thinking that, you know, what it all comes back to is making the work. And actually, what you're going to be doing most of the time uh, whilst you're navigating all of these other things that we're talking about is making the work. And I think that site of production we know can be so many different places. And we know the site of encounter can be so many different places. And I think one of the things that maybe has changed, and we'll see how it's changed, is where the audience is in all of this. Because, of course, the audience has to come to the work. And the work has been so many places for a really long time now, um, but maybe the audience is changing and maybe the audiences are seeing work in other places more. Maybe that's something. Um, yeah, but, but yeah, the art's where it, where it is. You know, art's the closest thing to magic, right? Apart from maybe technology, but yeah. <laughs> Art and magic, okay, well that's, but that's maybe the, the beginning of our next talk uh, when we next come together. Um, thanks everyone for being here, thank you Mary, thank you Dawn in Chicago, thank you Mia, um, and thanks all of you. That was, uh, yeah, a journey, a set of small journeys perhaps that we've described today. There's more, I know there are many more places we could have wound in, uh, up in. Uh, that's it from us, thank you, thanks a lot.